Okay, this is the intro to the recording for the Friday night Sabbath Eve Bible study for the 24th day of July 2020. We'll give the Hebrew date once we go live. God willing, we're going to be streaming live on the Facebook Live Sabbath service page. And we'll go there as soon as we get a green light. Looks like we got it. Greetings, welcome, happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom, welcome to the Friday evening Sabbath Eve Bible study. Yes, we're late tonight, a little late tonight, but I got something very special for you, an outstanding sermon by God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong tonight, and um, yeah, we got him standing by there, but now funny thing is, that's not matching up with my... Uh, with my video. So, let me see, what has happened? We've already signed on live, and we're not syncing up. Well, we'll get that fixed in a moment here, uh, one way or another, and I think what a, the other may have to be. I found out tonight there's a switch in the other room I can, a, a, a piece of equipment I can unplug and replug, and it'll reconnect things when we get out of sync. Uh, I got some new equipment, by the way, coming this week. I want to hook up and try out. Some of you may be familiar with a device called Google Chromecast. I'm going to test that out for some of the syncing up of things. But um, welcome tonight. If you've had a long week, you don't want to hear me talk about all the equipment problems we need to wrestle with. I see one of them, though, that is frustrating unless I quickly correct it and that's our white balance on this camera up here on this shot let me let me tell you while I do this that this is now the fifth day well correct that let me correct it. it's the fifth month but it's the fourth day of the fifth month on God's holy sacred calendar and brethren do you realize what that means in terms of the next holy day we're now less than two months away from the next holy day, which on God's sacred calendar is the first day of the seventh month. It's very, very easy to figure how long it is to the next holy day if we were going by the calendar of the future. And by that, here's what I mean. I mean, when Jesus Christ returns, the calendar that we're going to be using is not going to be this present calendar of the present evil world, the Roman calendar. It's going to be the Hebrew calendar, God's sacred calendar. And those of you who get used to using that now, you are preparing to be a king and a priest in the kingdom that Jesus Christ will usher in and restore the 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 government that he has qualified to usher in and restore, replace the government of this world that Lucifer turned Satan created in rebellion to God. So it's a government against God, and it's a government that, as Romans 12 verse 9 explains, deceiveth a few people here and a few people there. No, many of you, I know some of you who watch regularly know I'm playing with you on that because that scripture does not say who deceives a few people here and a few people there. It says that old serpent, that great dragon called a devil, the devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. Now, how in the world can that be that one being called the God of this world can deceive? the whole world well that's just it it's, the answer is in the question itself he's called the god of this world he transforms himself into an angel of light he tries to appear as the vicar of jesus christ and yet he is incarnate the devil that old serpent that great dragon called the devil and satan lucifer turned Satan, the devil. All right, now, what do we have for you tonight? We have, I don't want to waste a lot of time getting into it, although I'm going to prepare you a little bit for it. Uh, we have Mr. Armstrong, who will be speaking on the subject of 
the Trinity. Now you may say, oh, I know the Trinity. <clears throat> yes, well, some of you who are long time, who've been associated with God's church may know the truth about the Trinity. And yet, God's end time apostle is going to give a lot of details that flow around the, the false teaching of the Trinity. Now, some of you who may be tuning in brand new tonight, I've been meeting a lot of new people on my new job. And sometimes some of them ask me, now I can't solicit on the job, but sometimes I meet people later at lunch. You know, I go to these places where I meet a lot of people and they say they want my card and they, they want to tune in on this live video stream that I do. And, you know, actually I would encourage them to tune in on the weeknight live video stream if we were on the air with the nightly news related to the Bible and prophecy that I hope you will be praying that God will help me get back to that as quickly as he wills and is possible. And uh, listen, I know, again, I have to say to a lot of you who I haven't talked to in maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks, and yet you've called me and say, hey, Steve, please call me. A couple of fellows in California, I'm very uh, indebted and endeared to you because you've helped me create some things. I've restructured the uh, the corporate this corporate soul, the corporation soul that Robert Collins <clears throat> had me become the successor of, because I wanted to add a word to one of the terms in the corporation soul that he's made me the the bishop of. And instead of just calling a Church of God ministry, because there's another, there's a group out there that tries to get people to call themselves members of that group that has a very similar name. And after prayer and fasting, I don't, I'm, I'm unhappy. I think God was unhappy with that. <clears throat> and I, uh, without doing away with the other corporation, I've dovetailed into a new corporation soul that simply, that adds the word television because that's mainly what we do, Church of God Television Ministry. Not a group you can join, but we're using a new door that God has opened, the World Wide Web, which has video to it. Could be audio only, but, you know, we take advantage of the whole thing, the video with the audio. And we live stream on Church of God Television, as a, a Church of God Television Ministry, abbreviated COGTV by the acronym Church of God TV for television, and it is a ministry that God has opened up uh, or is using, and uh, yes, through yours truly. So my enemies, yeah, I've said something, You can, now you can run with something else, you can point your finger and say, listen to this guy. Well, you know, every time you do that, I get new viewers, so go ahead, have at me, call me the creepiest guy on the internet. There are people that tune in and disagree with you, by the way. And I would have agreed with you in the very beginning. I, yeah, you know, I didn't want to take this seat. I was very happy being on the other side of the camera. But listen, enough on me. I want to talk about what God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong is going to be covering tonight. The Trinity. Some of you who are brand new tuning in to see what I do on this live video stream as a Bible study on Friday nights, which is the eve of Sabbath. It is the Sabbath. You know, the days when God did the recreation, the evening and the morning were the first days. So the day begins in the evening, right after sunset. It doesn't begin in the middle of the night at midnight, as the world does it on the pagan Roman calendar. The days begin at the setting of the sun. Once the sun has set, has gone down. Yes, it's setting all afternoon, but once it is set, meaning it has gone down below the horizon, that begins a new day. And that begins the evening. And the evening and the morning were the first day through the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, that God created by resting. It also began at evening, once the sun had set. And the evening and the morning were the Sabbath. The seventh day of the week. We call it Saturday on the pagan Roman calendar. A system of honoring pagan Roman gods. The very days of the week are named after gods. The sun god, the moon god, the God of Thor for Thursday, the God of Fry for Friday. But that's the sixth day of the week. Friday is. It's the prep day. And this evening after sunset, even though we're going to call it Friday night until midnight tonight and reference it as the 24th day of July, it's become 
the fourth day of the fifth month on God's sacred calendar. Now, if you follow the calendar of the future, the calendar that Jesus Christ will be using, and I would say usher it and restore it, but the, the Jewish people have kept it in vogue. They've kept it alive, and they use it, and we use it, because you have to use it to figure out and you have to cross-relate it, unfortunately, to the Roman calendar to figure out when to be observing the, the annual Sabbaths that are mentioned in Leviticus 23, the next one of which is the first day of the seventh month, being the Feast of Trumpets. And then just to make a reference to the whole of the fall holy days that happen, occur in the fall, Following the first day of the seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets, nine days later on the tenth day of the seventh month, we have what you might call just the opposite of a feast. We have a fast day called the Day of at one Mint or Atonement on the tenth day of the seventh month. And then just five days later, it is five days later, on the 15th, from the 10th to the 15th is five days later, to the 15th of the seventh month then begins the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. That first day being a holy day, it runs for seven days and then attached right onto the end of that or almost as if it were glued onto the end of the Feast of Tabernacles of seven days is the eighth day of the feast, but it's a, a separate holy day, a separate annual Sabbath called the last great day. It's a holy day. So you got four holy days in the fall season. You got the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, First Day of Tabernacles, and the last great day. We're, we're, we're drawing closer and closer to it now. We are less than two months away from the Feast of Trumpets. Easy to figure if you're using and are accustomed to God's sacred calendar, the Hebrew calendar, because when you look at today being the fourth day of the fifth month, you just logically figure it out from there. We only have a little more than three weeks to go in the fifth month. We have the entire sixth month to go. And then the seventh month is on us. The very first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. That falls this year on September 18. And some of you looking at your calendar say, no, 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 Steve, that's on September 19 this year. Well, if you wait till the 19th, you miss the beginning of it because the beginning of it starts at sunset on September 18, and then, yeah, the bulk of it is on the 19th of September. But you've got to be thinking of it on the 18th. When the sun goes down, first day of trumpets has begun as the first day of the seventh week. All right, I think I probably covered that enough for still being more than, a little more than seven weeks away from it, seven weeks and a few days away from the first day of the seventh month, Feast of Trumpets. All right, that subject of the Trinity and some of the things that Mr. Armstrong is going to cover. It's such an exciting talk that he gives tonight. I hope you're prepared for it. I'm going to stop him just once or twice because he reminds me of when I was begging God to show me where his true church was and that kind of thing. And um, listen, I apologize for our being so late in beginning tonight the live stream. Of course, if you're watching, from, watching it from the archive, as some of you do on Sabbath morning from the United Kingdom, you've told me, you know, you're going to get the beginning of it from the time you punch the beginning of it. So it doesn't matter when we began here, just as long as I've got it in the archive there for you. And you, you use it as a morning service and then tune in with us live for the afternoon service that we do in the morning in the United States at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, which works out to be 2.30 in the afternoon in the United Kingdom. Perfect time. That's the time we used to, Mr. Armstrong would begin services in Pasadena at what was then the headquarters for, you're going to hear him make a reference to the Worldwide Church of God, and in that generic reference, he's referring to the Church of God of the Sixth Era, the Philadelphia Era of the Church of God, and that, that the Church of God is not an organization. He a number of times told us, don't be calling ourselves members of the corporate name of the church, which was Radio Church of God at one time, Worldwide Church of God at another time. He said, 
you're baptized not into any denomination of men. So the naming with an adjective of the Church of God is the worldwide Church of God. He says, you're not a member of that unless you were on the board of directors. He says, you're a member simply of the Church of God, a spiritual organism for the sixth era, the Philadelphia era, also known as the body of Christ. But generically speaking, when you hear him reference the worldwide Church of God, he's referring to the Church of God, Philadelphia era that continues until the fifth seal, seal opens. And I know some of you say, oh, I can't listen to this man saying that because my minister says we're now in the Laodicean, seventh era. Well, your minister is compromising on what God taught us as the truth through his end time apostle, and your minister does not have the authority to change that doctrine, nor does your minister's doctrine fo follow the doctrine set in the church according to the Bible. What God taught us through Mr. Armstrong is supported by and proved in your Bible, and there's several places you can look, but especially Revelation 3, verse 18, that sets the timing for the Laodicean era yet to come. It's a fifth seal era, an era of martyrdom. And you're, if you're left behind to commence that era, yeah, people are here with that attitude, big time. They were even here when Mr. Armstrong was alive with that attitude. And Mr. Armstrong even warned us, brethren, we are in danger of becoming the Laodicean era. And so some people having heard that, some ministers even, say, well, Mr. Armstrong died and here we are. Now we've become that era. He warned us we would become if we don't wake up. No, we haven't. We still have time to wake up. It might be a very little bit of time, but you still have time to wake up. As, as Mr. Armstrong told us, that era begins after the fifth seal opens up, which means after the Great Tribulation begins, after the two witnesses begin their testimony with powers mentioned in Revelation 11 to, among other things, be able to turn water into blood. Those claiming to be here as the two witnesses now challenge them, brethren. Bring them a bottle of water and ask them to change that into blood. Don't be as bashful or afraid to do it. It clearly says in Revelation they will have those powers. They make excuses and say that, oh, you are being irreverent to ask me to do that. No, you're not. We're, we are instructed to prove all things. Some couple of human men out there claiming to be God's end time two witnesses, make them prove up or shut up. Bring them a glass of water. Say, look, it's not going to be not a big deal for you. If you prove it, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, buy you lunch or whatever. <laughs> but you can't prove it. I mean, they can't prove it. You can tell them there's a man out there saying they can't prove themselves. They are to have powers once they have that title. And one of those powers is to be able to change water into blood. I, I thump on that because I, 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 some of you trouble me. Some of you call me and you say that all the time. Others of you, I see you writing it on Facebook about how 7,000 people are going to join these two witnesses in this group with this children's park thing they're continuing putting a little money into with it. God started a thing with Mr. Armstrong. You know, you're trying to steal Mr. Armstrong's honor with that and trying to put it to something that so, so what? You put a few bucks into that, you know? And a big deal anyway right now. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm mocking you on that. Because you're misusing. You are using something to promote yourselves when, when you're not what you claim to be. And brethren, some, those of you who are following the men who are doing that, you need to, you need to prove up. Have them prove up. They can't do it. All right, I know I stepped on a few of you's toes with that, but that's just the way it is. What we do right here is we are uncompromising on the truth. Now listen, I ran into some trouble some months ago. Some of you, I'm very grateful to you for having helped me at that time of trouble. Uh, God was having me learn some lessons. He still is. However, he hasn't given up on me and vice versa, you know. I, I've, I've had a bad attitude at times through uh, some of the trials that God has let me go through. 
And, you know, that that's part of it, brethren. God wants to see how we will react on things. And I'm having a trial right now. One piece of our equipment is not was decided to give us a hard time. Oh, and that's part of the reason why I, I, some of this software you load up wants to take over your computer at times. All right, now let me see. All right, we still haven't got it back yet where I need it to be and have it do what I need to do. You know, I could, it would be nice if I had some help that I could turn to and say, would you go into the control room behind us and pull the plug on the network connection and then wait 10 seconds and then put it back in. Now, not on, not on the uh, modem. I'd cut us off the live stream, but we can cut off the network syncing stuff and resync it, and then sometimes when this connection falls apart, we can get it back together that way. Now, with me not being able to run into the other room and do that, because I can't play anything for you, I just, we just it'd be like dead, dead air on radio or television. If I jump up and go in the other room and I, I, I can't play a video, I can't do anything without the circuitry working that I have to work with. So look, I'm explaining that to you and will appreciate your prayer as I reboot one of the, of the devices that we need to see if that'll sync it back up. It's saving a picture that we had on it a moment ago. Uh, and I'm glad it's not just uh, putting up the blank computer screen because that's kind of ugly but um, I'm rebooting we'll get it back up in a moment I'll see if I can do it from where we're sitting but that's given me an opportunity to ad lib to you a little bit and hopefully get you excited about this sermon from 1978 that you're going to see that Mr. Armstrong gave in Big Sandy Texas that we're going to use for the Bible study tonight I have gone through it I've got the scriptures that he gives that we can keep on the screen next to him while he's speaking to help you. Um, you know, we had one way of doing it when I worked in the television studio at headquarters. And, you know, there's new software and stuff now that enables you to do things a little different. And sometimes a little, you, you, can, you can add to it in a nice way. And we do, I do that for you to help. And, uh, um, you know, while I try to get that back up, can I uh, give you a short icebreaker? Some of you might like to know this. Uh, one reason I'm late tonight is because I had a pile of stuff while I took off today. I was scheduled to work tonight, by the way, by my boss. Uh, and I, try, I asked him to let me off. And they twice before, they just canceled the day out of work for me. I couldn't even come in in the morning and work. They just canceled out the day, which was fine. Now, it came down, though, where they weren't cooperating with me anymore at work, and I'll find out Sunday, Monday, when I attempt to go back to work, whether I still have my job over there or not. But uh, that job's been helpful toward me paying bills without having to burden any of you about that or ask you, you know, hey, we help. I need help. Um, some of you have done that voluntarily. I appreciate you guys in California and others of you who've... Um, who've done that to be helpful. Um, and, uh, but I'm trying to do it myself, so I don't have to ask any of you for anything like that. And uh, there's an example of the Apostle Paul doing that, and I, I like his example. And uh, as I mentioned that, let me say greetings out there to Paul Kiefer. Paul tunes into me once in a while. He's wanted me to get together with him and, and he's got some suggestions for me. And Paul, I'm looking forward to when we can do that. Um, I don't know, maybe you went through some trials too, but I sure have been through a big trial since the last feast. And, uh, all right, as I, as I mentioned, I'm in a trial right now. Uh, let's see, how am I going to cover this? Okay, just bear with me. I, yeah, I can see where to go. I just have to concentrate on it for a minute. And those of you who bear with me, we're going to have a very, very special sermon tonight. And um, I know it can be boring when we have a problem. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to go to media, not video. Media, media, media. Where's that? Okay. Oh, and I'm supposed to go to it on another drive. All right. I'm getting there. Sometimes I have a one-track mind. 
and to try to do two things at once, talk about something else while you look for something over here. Okay, I got it. We got it. So the ones where we're edited, and we're going to go to the last one in 1978. Um, just about there. Okay, we got it. Is God a Trinity? Okay, now, let's see if we can get this circuitry to pop back up on here for us. And if it does, Mr. Armstrong's picture will change, <laughs> and it means we'll be ready to go. In the meantime, I'll tell you, brethren, I've been working a full-time job, <clears throat> and uh, and and uh, although that's only one job, it's a job that <clears throat> that is uh, harder than a lot of jobs I worked. And even though I worked some hard jobs while I was in high school, I worked three jobs while I was in high school. Can I tell you about this real quick while we wait for the circuitry to to resync? <clears throat> um, I took. At our high school, we had, uh, for everybody who went to this particular high school, we had what was called advanced academics. I was put on that program, took a few classes in the summer to help continue that. And I also was able, to, my senior year, to go on what was called the uh, vocational program. So I was in advanced academics and the vocational program. Now that means I went to school from 8 to noon, had lunch, and halfway through the lunch period from noon to one, I was able to leave school at 12.30 because I had a job I went to as part of the vocational thing. I went to my first job from one o'clock in the afternoon to five o'clock. That was one job at a department store where I announced the store specials and blah, 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 blah. Then I did my second job between five and seven in the evening where I threw newspapers. Then from 7 to midnight, I worked my third job at a radio station where they call me the producer. It was a fancy way of keeping you interested in answering the phones at night and talking to listeners and taking down what songs they wanted to hear and then running in the newsroom and tearing off the news off the teletype and the weather for the announcer to read at five minutes before the hour. That was my job between 7 and midnight. Then I'd drive home, get home around 12.30, 1 o'clock at night. I and uh, I worked till midnight, but we were often there for a little after midnight. Be home by 12.30, 1 o'clock. Between 1 and 7 o'clock, I'd get six hours sleep, get up, shave, shower, have breakfast, take off, and repeat all that. School from 8 to noon, take off at 12.30 after lunch, work my first job, 1 to 5, second job, throwing newspapers, 5 to 7, squeeze dinner in there somewhere and then worked the third job from 7 to midnight. That means I worked over nine hours on the two clock, clock end jobs and throwing newspapers another hour, hour and a half, <clears throat> getting my newspaper thrown. So I was working at least 10 hours a day while I was in high school, going to high school four hours a day, <clears throat> and, uh, and did that for that year. All right, so now I'm trying to do what I do here and work uh, a full-time job at a... Uh, at a store where I, I greet people and sometimes help with the carts and whatever we do in that front section there and make sure people have their mask during this pandemic. I'm very happy. Can I just tell you this about these mask things? You know, I don't have one in, with me in here. I don't bring them in the house, but I have to wear it on the job. But people who come and Alabama law allows this. I'm very glad they allow this option. And I was delighted to be able to treat someone to that option the other night. They allow, if you have a medical reason, quote unquote, they call it medical reason or health reason why you don't want to wear the mask, that's an exception that under the law is allowed as long as the store you're going into will follow the law fully. Also, you're you are allowed to not wear the mask if, if for religious reasons you can't wear it. Now, I am not encouraging any of you who are part of the Church of God to say it's your religious belief, unless you tell me something in the Bible you find that really, really, really would qualify that. Uh, I, I went into a store this afternoon, forgot my mask, I dumped a bunch of stuff into a basket, you know, for the Sabbath to be able to eat a grocery store. And I was aware there halfway through it that, oh, I don't have my mask. Well, I said, I'm going to continue on and hope nobody really 
notices. I got all the way to the register, was able to pay for my stuff. The uh, cashier rang up a bottle of sparkling water that I wanted to have on the Sabbath, small bar up bottle that shows on the shelf as 69 cents a bottle. Real bargain to me, Italian sparkling water for 69 cents at an Aldi store. Uh, but, and I got three of them. And each one of them rang up at $3.49 each. Well, I might have let one go, being in a hurry. But three of them at three fifty dollars was over $10. And that was at least $10 in error. Because they should have been $0.69. Cents. And, um, well, I'll, we'll see. About, what was that? Plus tax, it would have been $10 in error. So I mentioned it. And... Uh, and while she's calling the manager to straighten that out, I said, hey, well, look, uh, while you straighten that out, I'll run out to the car and get my mask, you know. So I ran out, I got my mask. All right, I'm just telling you that because of this mask thing. A shopper came last night, a lady and her daughter, and they weren't wearing the mask. And when I uh, reminded them, you know, about the mask, she said, well, we don't wear them for uh, a health reason, a medical reason. We can't breathe with them. That is allowable under the law in Alabama. And she started to explain in detail about why she had the breathing difficulty and condition that she had and that her daughter had asthma and et cetera. I had already, as soon as she mentioned that it was a, for a medical health reason, I had already waved them in and said, go ahead. You know, you don't need it. I just have to radio in to my bosses that, you know, y'all are coming in for that reason. Only they didn't give me a radio, so I had to run inside and tell people. Uh, but I tell them, you know, and, and if you, anybody asks you, you can tell them you've talked to me and that I, under, you know, that I waved you in, that you're clear, you go in. Now, of course, you know, that troubles some shoppers. Some shoppers will come out and say there's nine people in the store not wearing a mask, you know, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and, <laughs> and it reminds you of times when people call the police on other people, you know, for this or that. But... These people I allowed in last night were allowed in under an exception that is in the Alabama law on it. Anyway, what am I telling you all that for? All right, I have a job at, you know, and sometimes I do the part with the carts that will make me come home very exhausted. Uh, but that's fine. I'm really happy that I can be earning the extra income and having it to pay against these bills. Now, some of my creditors... Ah, you can pay us more than you're paying us. Well, no, I can't. <laughs> you don't have many bills I have. Anyway, uh, this roofing stuff was over 30000 bucks, And at 30% interest on some of them, it really cranks up the bill. But I hope to get on top of that and even be able to build. And uh, I'm looking at, I've run into a builder who showed me this dome building they built for a church in Wylam, for a church organization. And of course, they call the building the church in a lot of places, and it has a dome on it. I just love it. It's beautiful, and uh, it's kind of tornado and hurricane-proof. I just, you know, we could have our own Dome of the Rock right here on this acreage that I donated to the Church of God television ministry, several acres I have, next to 100 acres that it's just woods behind it with a creek running through it. It's just, and it's a natural Indian creek with Indian caves along the side. Just beautiful, wonderful place for Feast of Tabernacles. So is a place in Florida that, that we're looking at. And um, for those of you who tune in here that might like to be able to assemble for some fellowship during the feast, I am praying and fasting and asking God, can we do that this year? I appreciate it if some of you do too. A couple of fellows in New York started checking out the price of hotels. Well, I've got news for you guys. During the fall days, those prices that you found you know, you need to ask them, well, what will the price be in the fall? They're not going to tell you right now. We're going to reduce the price by about half in the fall because that's our off season. And, you know, that's wonderful that we have the feast at that time when we can get a nice discount on things. But anyway, we're looking into a few things like that. And, um, um, all right, now I've tried to add them a little bit to see if, this thing is going to, um, you know, I may be forced to, to um, do something. Let's do this. Let's put a scripture up on the screen. And if you'll bear with me for 30 seconds so that I can recycle this thing in a way that I know makes it work, I'll just 
pop this scripture up on the screen. It's going to be the first scripture that Mr. Armstrong uses. Actually, they'll probably have to do better than that. Let me, uh, let me put a scripture up on the screen. I know we're delaying getting to Mr. Armstrong, but um, we have an hour and a half for Bible study, so let me bring us Mike over. I'm going to punch up Luke 21, 36, a verse of scripture that we should be keeping on our minds all week long, every day of the week, because it's instruction by which Jesus Christ and God the Father determine who is accounted worthy to escape the great tribulation. So, can I do this, brother? Will you bear with me for a minute worth of silence, maybe even pray about this scripture, ask God to inspire your mind to really be full of inspiration to do what Christ is telling us in this scripture and to understand it. While I leave it with you, hang on. I'll be back in just a minute. I'm going to recycle things and see if we can get the video where Mr. Armstrong will play. Hang on. I'll be right back. Take a good look, hearty look at this scripture. Say a silent prayer. If you're with somebody, both of you take a turn praying. God help us understand and, and fulfill this verse of scripture. I'll be right back. Give me a minute. Just give me a minute. Be right back. Okay, brother, all right, I'm back with you. I recycled the, the network uh, system, and look at there. We got it up and ready. I'm going to go ahead and put Mr. Armstrong's logo up here. It's the 24th day of July tonight, Friday night. That'll change to 25th of July in the morning. But it'll still be the fourth day of the fifth month, as it is right now after sunset. It's going to still be the fourth day of the fifth month in the morning. When we hold the morning service. But, uh, Mr. Armstrong, hey, I wonder if you'd mind, sir, Turn around this way and let me say hello. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> nice to see his face, isn't it, brethren? One of the most faithful servants of God for these latter days. A man through whom God gave us not a little, but much truth uh, and significant stuff. Some of you think it's a small thing to know who is the sixth king of Revelation 17, verse 10. Let me not go into that or I'll be off into a whole sermon. And maybe we'll talk about that in the morning. Uh, let's get to Mr. Armstrong on this, this uh, sermon that he has for us. From 1978, he was giving it in Big Sandy, Texas, before the students and, 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 and employees and those in the Big Sandy area in December of 1978. And it's entitled, and he's really going to cover a lot of stuff. And I hope you won't mind, both my audience and Mr. Armstrong, that I'm going to, I'm going to come in after he says a few words and share something with you. But uh, let's see if I can get it on without doing a feedback here. God's End Time Apostle, speaking from December 1978. The subject, it covers more than this, but it does cover this well. And it's this section is entitled... Is God a Trinity? And I'm sorry, I need to get that where he's going to come right up with us here. Is God a Trinity? God's end time apostle, Herbert Armstrong. Greetings, everybody. You're living in a world that is just filled with religious confusion. I wonder if you ever stop to think about how many religions we have. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do the feedback, but brethren, right there, right in the very beginning, I did want to come in and mention this with you, that uh, when uh, God was first beginning to call me, uh, Mr. Armstrong, yes, sir, I did think about what you just mentioned about all the world's religions. And, uh, you know, let me go back to this other shot, because I noticed for those of you who need the closed captions, they're not 
they weren't in that screenshot. But um, um, when God was first calling me, and I saw Matthew 16, verse 18, where Christ said, I will build my church. The thing that had that came on my mind after looking at that scripture was, well, then why do the Protestant churches have so many different denominations? Baptist over here on this corner, across the street from them, a Methodist, across the street from that, a Presbyterian, the big Catholic church just down the middle of the block, and, uh, and, and ad infinitum, all these other groups, the first Baptist and the second Baptist and the third and the fourth and the whatever and then this and that and the other thing. And uh, why? If, if, if Jesus Christ is building his church, how could one person build it with all this confusion? Because all these different groups, they teach it different. That doesn't sound like one author to me. Well, it is one author, but it's the author of confusion, the God of this world who, who grabs whatever he can and runs with it, and, and, and it's a bag of confusion. You know, when I, after I came into the church, I used to see tracts that people would pass out in the Protestant churches called Mr. Confusion, referring to Mr. Armstrong, but really, he had the truth. And when I, after I prayed and asked God, where is your church? After three weeks of a lot of tough prayer on that, God caused me to hear a broadcast of Mr. Armstrong opening up with the very same questions. And that relates to kind of what he's saying here. And let's go back to him. In other parts of the world, we don't think of much here in the United States. Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shintoism, Hinduism, the Muslim religion that fills the Arab world and spills over into a great deal more, especially in Africa, then the religion of Christianity that pretty well engulfs the world, but especially in Europe and America and South America. The largest religion in the world is the Roman Catholic religion. And uh, if you take what is called Christianity, including the Protestant religion, it is really by far bigger. Now, you might have thought that some religion like Buddhism or Confucianism would be larger because they're the religions over in India and China and nations like that that are far more populous nations and so many more people than there are here. But the Christian religion, as it is called, is by far the largest. Well, the generally accepted Christian teaching about God, now getting into the Christian religion, is that God is a trinity. That is, three persons in one. And they say it's one God, but in three persons. God in three persons. Blessed trinity. I used to sing that song before I knew better. I don't sing it anymore because it's as fake and false as it can be. Sometimes I think of these intellectuals, as someone told me the other day, they are the SSSs, you know, smart, smart, stupid. That's just what it is. Uh, now then, how did that Trinity doctrine get in there? Well, Jesus Christ came and raised up his church, and he said his church would last through all generations. But there was a beginning somewhere between, oh, say, 60 and 70 A.D., a lost century for 100 years, uh, when all the recorded history regarding the church had been systematically destroyed. You can't find it. There isn't any. It was all destroyed. But a hundred years later, about 170 A.D., the curtain will lift, and you look on, and there is a church. And the church called itself Christianity. But it is about as different from the church of 31 and 40 A.D. and along in those years as black is from white or up is from down. It was just about as opposite. And there's no record. You can't find a record of it. But we find the record before that happened, and we find the record of what happened afterward. 
Now, Jesus had said, as I say, that the gates of hell or the grave would never prevail against his church. His church was founded in 31 A.D., uh, but by 58 A.D., and some uh, so-called authorities say it was about 53, uh, when uh, the Apostle Paul wrote his book to the Galatians, uh, you will find that uh, here in Galatians, the first chapter, Paul said in writing to the churches up in Galatia, this is about, let's say, 58 A.D., I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now, some may think it is Paul that called them, but God is the one who calls us. But they've been removed from God into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ had been suppressed. Jesus came with the gospel, which is his message. And that message was suppressed. Now, it has been supplanted, and in our day, you hear a lot about what they call the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that is only a message of man about the person of Christ. Now, Jesus Christ was the messenger, as you read back in Malachi, the third chapter in the first verse. He was the messenger of the covenant. So a lot of people have the gospel of the messenger and about the messenger, but they forget his message. Now, I will say it's very well and good to preach about the messenger because he is a very important part of that gospel. But he, after all, was the messenger, and that's, uh, that's not the whole gospel. And what he came preaching was the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that no one has preached for over, uh, well, for over 1,900 years. Not from around 58 or 60, and certainly not after 70 A.D., until 1953 A.D., when I first began to preach that gospel all over Europe, on the most powerful radio station in Europe. It was not preached. 1,900 years went by. Well, uh, now I wanted to come to this thing about the mystery of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Trinity doctrine. By the 4th century... Uh, there had been a dual, very violent controversy uh, raging around Rome, and uh, Rome by that time was the center of what was called Christianity. Uh, there was uh, uh, one leader by the name of Polycrates uh, who had a very, con a very great controversy against the bishops of Rome uh, on uh, uh, the matter of whether we should observe the Passover which is the 14th day of the first uh, sacred month, as uh, Christ said it, or whether we should observe the pagan day of Easter. And then uh, there was a Dr. Arius, who was a priest from, uh, uh, from uh, Alexandria, and he was in a red-hot uh, uh, argument against the bishops at Rome about this trinity, the bishops of Rome, uh, Rome wanted the Trinity doctrine, and as a matter of fact, they, they had the same gospel that had really uh, come out of ancient Babylon, the Babylonian mystery religion. Dr. Arius didn't have it right, he didn't have the truth, but at least he was against the Trinity. And uh, we don't need to go into what he did believe, because he was wrong too, as far as that is concerned. But uh, to show you how bloody it was, Dr. Arius was finally burned at the stake. Now that question, both questions, were settled by the emperor Constantine in 325 A.D. Constantine was a Roman emperor. Constantine claimed that he had seen a vision one time uh, of a cross. And uh, it, it said, by this sign you may conquer. So he said, well, I'll tell you, I'll adopt the Christian religion. Maybe I can win this battle I'm going into in a, in, a, in, a, in a war. And he happened to win that war, so he said, well, I'm going to join the Christian church. Now, he didn't, get, uh, he didn't come to it in the way I did. He just said, I'll join the Christian church. That's the way most people do. They just go in and join like you join any club, uh, anything of the kind. But Constantine is the one who settled this controversy. He called what is called the Nicene Council. And uh, 
that Nicene Council was the first real ecumenical council, uh, and the Catholic Church is still holding some now and then. And there, the Trinity was made official, and so was Easter, and anyone that would observe Passover would have been persecuted and uh, probably martyred and killed. Also, in the authorized version of the Bible, commonly called the King James, the Holy Spirit is referred to a great many times as he, or his, or him, and not as it. And so they say, well, that proves that the Holy Spirit is a person. But there are other places in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit is referred to as it. And brethren, if you don't mind, I'd like to comment just on that. You know how many things, especially in the French language, uh, everything is labeled as uh, feminine or masculine. And uh, it's, it's, it's some of the things you can think of uh, that are similar to that would be things like, for example, uh, a ship is often called she. You know, hey, you christen that ship and you say she's ready to sail. And... Sometimes that was done in the uh, translation of the Bible where the Holy Spirit was called He. And I say that for the benefit of some of you new people that I have run into that are going to be tuning in here and hearing this for the first time. It, like Mr. Armstrong just said here, God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong just said that other places in the Bible refer to the Holy Spirit not as He but as It. And it is a power. It's a power. It's like the Internet. God can use it to speak to people's minds. When you have his spirit, God can speak to you directly through that spirit. And just like sending an email on the Internet. You know, you can use the Internet. I just make that example. God uses the example of the Holy Spirit being like wind. It can move, and it's powerful. All right, let's go back. Go back to Mr. Armstrong now. And they overlook that, don't they? Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a person. It is the Spirit that emanates from God, that emanates also from Christ, the same identical Spirit. And uh, both of them are of one mind. They are both Spirit and composed of Spirit. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. Oh, the beginning about God and who and what God is, we begin in John, the first chapter and the first verse. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, this Word is translated from the Greek word logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Logos means word or uh, spokesman, the one who does the speaking. And uh, it's a personage. But it is the personage who uh, was the spokesman of the Godhead. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now in, in Ephesians, the third chapter and the ninth verse, it speaks there of God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 and 9, you'll find it if you turn to it. Now I'd like to have you turn over to Hebrews, the uh, seventh chapter of Hebrews, and beginning with verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. There never was a time. He was never born, never a time when he did not exist. He has always existed the same as God, the, uh, which now we think of as God the Father, but made a son of God, abideth a priest continually. And that is really speaking of Christ there. Now then, let's go back to Genesis 1.1. This is supposed to be the creation chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens, and it should be plural, heavens, as Moses wrote it in the Hebrew language, and the earth. Now the word for God in the Hebrew language is Elohim. Elohim is a... Uh, uh, it is a word like uh, the word family, like the word church, like the word uh, group, or like the word team. Uh, uh, it's more than one person, but making one church, one family, one group. Not several groups, but one group, and it might be of 
four or five people. It might be of four or five thousand people. Uh, it all depends. And uh, uh, in the beginning, Elohim. Now that is more than one person, but forming one God. Now this does not say it was three persons, four persons, or how many. But I can tell you right now, by putting it together with John 1.1, 1, 1, it is referring to God and the Word. And it is not referring to three persons, but one. I mean, but two. Two persons forming one God. Created the heaven and the earth. Now, actually, it was God who did it by and through the Word, who became Jesus Christ much later. Uh, now then, uh, let me see from there. Uh, notice Genesis 2 and verse 4. Let me explain first. The word God, all the way through the first chapter of Genesis, uh, has been uh, translated from the name that Moses wrote, Elohim. Elohim is the unit plural that means more than one uh, person, but one God. Not two gods, only one God. But God is more than one person. And I'm going to show you that we can be born into the family of God. And now God is the father of Christ. He wasn't originally, but he is now. And Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. And we can be born of God and be born into that family. And it is a great family. And the Trinity doctrine limits God so that it prevents the very purpose for which men were placed on this earth. To become members of that God family. God is reproducing himself. That's what he put human beings on the earth for. Now, you never heard anyone else say that. I don't know anyone that says such a thing. They will tell you I'm crazy or something. Well, now you better decide who's crazy. Now we come to a new word introduced by Moses. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the, here you find Lord God. Now in the King James, the word Lord will appear in capital letters. And wherever it appears in capital letters, that means it came from the Hebrew Yahweh. Now no one knows exactly how to pronounce it, so I, I may not pronounce it correctly, but uh, if you think I don't, you don't either, because no one knows what is the correct pronunciation. And... Uh, Anyway, it's uh, in the Hebrew language, they use only the uh, consonants and the vowels are just added. It's Y-H-W-H, uh, but usually spelled like uh, uh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E uh, Yahweh. Now, there is no word in the English language that is the equivalent of this Yahweh, which is one of the names of God. But that is the name that is, is of the specific person that was called the Word in John 1, verse 1. John in the New Testament. Uh, now we begin to see a difference between the Elohim. Uh, Yahweh Elohim means uh, the Lord God, or the Yahweh is the one of the God family that is here referred to. Uh, he is the one who was the spokesman, and it meant word or speaker. Notice what it says here. Uh, they were created in the day that the eternal, or uh, I like the word eternal. Let me go back and finish what I started there. Uh, there's no word in the English language that properly uh, translates Yahweh. And uh, the, the translators have always had difficulty. In the King James, they put Lord, which means master, the one that you obey. But in the Moffat translation, he translated it uh, the eternal. And uh, the Farrar Fenton translation translates it the ever living. Now, the word Yahweh means the self existent one, one who uh, uh, has always existed and always will, without father, without mother, without beginning of days or end of life. Uh, that's exactly what it means. And. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the one that was with God and the one by whom God made everything and the one who did the speaking. I prefer to use the name that uh, the Moffat translation does, the eternal. The ever-living is fine, but it takes two words. But it means the one who is eternally living, self-existent, 
and also who is Lord and Master. It, it, it involves all of those things, and there's no one word in the English language that will answer to that. Uh, so I just say the eternal God. And uh, eternal means the one who became Christ. Now, by a resurrection from the dead, Jesus has become very God. Back here in Hebrews, the first chapter and verse 8, but unto uh, the Son, meaning Christ, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness uh, is the scepter of thy kingdom, meaning Christ's kingdom. He's the king of that kingdom. Now then, I'd like to tie that in with Romans Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1, verse 1 of Romans. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, as a human being, according to the flesh, he was the son of David because his mother Mary was descended directly from David, just as I am, but through probably through another strain, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Now, as a human being, he was the Son of David, but by the resurrection he became the Son of God. Now, he was also the Son of God before his crucifixion. And he was the only begotten Son of God, the only one who had ever been begotten by God prior to human birth. But we can be begotten of God prior to our uh, spirit birth in the kingdom of God. But not, that's a little different than the way Jesus was the uh, only begotten Son of God. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message in the world, which today is the Worldwide Church of God, knows that God is not a trinity. He is not a trinity. The Holy Spirit is the spirit that emanates from God and from Christ and can enter into man. Now you'll notice that in the second chapter of Acts, for example, in verse 38, and this was when Peter had just received the Holy Spirit, his first inspired sermon. Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit can come into us, and we can be begotten of God, and then can be born of God. Now, if you turn back to John again, right at the very beginning, in the third chapter of John, here Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he was a Pharisee, and he sneaked in by night because he didn't want the other Pharisees to know he was seeing Jesus because they wouldn't have anything to do with him. The same came to Jesus by night, verse 2. That's in John, the third chapter. John 3 and verse 2. And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. We know. We, we, we Pharisees know. All the Pharisees knew it. So they had no excuse for what they did. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is something that can be seen, but it can only be seen by those who have been born again. And let me tell you something. The President of the United States has not yet seen the kingdom of God. What do you think of that? Nor has the Queen of England, nor has the head of any other government anywhere in the world. Nor have I, nor have you. You haven't seen the kingdom of God because it hasn't appeared yet. Now, uh, there is the kingdom of God. Uh, let's continue a little further here. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. I was born of the flesh. I am flesh. You are born of the flesh. You are flesh. You're not spirit. You're flesh. There is a spirit in us, but that is not us. It's, it's just like uh, 
Well, I've often said you swallow a little tiny marble, and the marble is not you, but it's in you. And the spirit is something that is in us, but not, uh, it's not us. And it's not a, it's not a soul. And uh, he, he said, uh, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When you're born of the spirit, you will become spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Now he said, unless you're born of the Spirit, in verse 5, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So it's something we can enter into, but not in this life, not while we're born of the flesh. Now then, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, you'll find something on that that I'd like to turn to for just a second right here. And so it is written in verse 45, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, not an immortal soul, a living soul. The last Adam, meaning Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, as is the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, listen carefully, that flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I am flesh and blood, and as long as I'm flesh and blood, I can't enter the kingdom of God. The president of the United States is flesh and blood, therefore he has not entered into the kingdom of God and has not been born again. The same is true of the Queen of England. The same is true of all of you listening. It's true of all of us. We're just all of us human. We're all in that same boat together. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God, then, is the spirit that gives and imparts to us the divine life by which we can be born into the very family of God. Now, God is not a trinity. God is the creator. He is the one who created heaven and earth, who created all the nations of one blood and uh, uh, not of one language because he divided the languages. But I think I've pretty well shown you now uh, something of the nature of God. God originally was God and the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and became Jesus Christ and by his birth from the, uh, the Virgin Mary, Jesus, became a son of God, but he also was a son of man. By resurrection from the dead, he became a son of God and the firstborn of many brethren to be born again of God by a resurrection into the family of God. And the message that he preached was the gospel of the kingdom of God into which we are born. In other words, it's the family of God as a government ruling the whole vast universe. All right, brethren, thank you for those of you who were tuned in tonight. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong, for that outstanding sermon that he gave in 1978. And those truths are, haven't changed. They're still true today. <clears throat> and for those of us who've been called to the spring harvest, very meaningfully true because uh, you have a first opportunity to be born into that family of God and become as God is God is God you become spirit no longer this like one of the verses said you know this mortal shall put on immortality we don't have an immortal soul right now as Mr. Einstein has explained many times the soul that sins shall what live forever in hell fire no that's not what the verse says. That's what you hear men say who stand up behind pulpits of this, this denomination or that denomination. But if they read it to you straight from the Bible, you'll hear that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The very first lie of Satan the devil was to Mother Eve, you shall not surely die. After he had asked her, you know, did God say you could eat all the fruit here? And she said, no, we, well, we can eat all of the fruit except from this one tree over here. 
the tree of the forbidden fruit. We can't eat that or we'll surely die. And Satan, the devil, just jumped right on top of that. Oh, you won't surely die? And he tried to persuade Eve, and he was successful at it, that, look, you eat this fruit, you'll become like God. You'll know stuff you don't know now. And it'll make you wise. Yeah, it makes you wise to evil. But many of you who suffer from various evils have probably wished you never knew that evil. And the whole world would have been a whole lot better off had Eve not eaten that forbidden fruit. Because we wouldn't have known the evils that we've known, including world wars. All right, brother, we're... And friends, you know, we cover a lot of stuff here that's very, very different from what you learn in the world. Those of you who are brethren say, well, I've known this ever since I've grown up in the church. I've heard this and heard this and heard this. And the very reason we have Sabbath services weekly, week after week after week, is so that we won't forget the truth. And I'm sad to say that many people have forgotten a lot of the truth because they're listening to people who've compromised it. But we'll save that for the morning, and I'll try to cover some things I mentioned to you. You fellows who uh, asked me to give you a call in New York after I'm off, uh, you have to be patient a little bit, because after I sign off, I have to convert the video so that it will upload to Vimeo and YouTube, where there are people here and there who watch it from there. They don't, not, they don't tune into Facebook. They can't get it live. But they get it later, either tonight or in the morning. And I don't want to be up all night. So um, I've had long nights this week. I'm looking forward to some sleep. I have to be up at 930. So what you want to talk to me about, be prepared to talk to it, uh, to me. And uh, let's see, you fellows in California, it's earlier for you. But unless it's urgent, unless I get a call from you, I'll try to pick it up. Otherwise, if you'll bear with me a few days, I will get to you. And some others of you, even some close friends of mine, are probably wondering, why in the world haven't you called me? It's not because I'm trying to ignore you. It's not because uh, I don't want to talk to you. It's because, um, like I mentioned to you when I worked those three jobs, right now I'm balancing uh, a brand new job that I come home from. I come home from exhausted and help that I had here, feeding my animals and helping me take care of the grounds is uh, is not a, is temporarily I don't know I don't know how long temporarily but it's not available to me and um, I'm having to take care of everything again when I get home I have to feed animals I have to feed them in the morning before I leave and uh, go buy their food and do things that I had some help hired help here doing that I presently temporarily uh, he's not able to be here and I don't want to say much more than that for right now, but I will appreciate your prayers. I can be on top of everything. And some of you who want me to give you a call, you know, listen, if you need an anointed cloth, if you let me know by some means of, uh, by email or something, I do respond to those. I sacrifice every, I'll drop everything and anoint a cloth for you, say a prayer for you, uh, prepare the letter, the cover letter that goes with it, and get it in the mail to you. So, uh, and some of you know that. I've done that. I go out of my way to, to cover that James 5 provision. And uh, like Mr. Collins said to me, Christ is going to expect more out of you now, and I try to give it everything I can give. But, uh, right, but otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I, I, I apologize for those, some of you I haven't gotten back to, and I'd like to. And some of you I've gotten some special surprises um, in a thrift store where a friend of mine and I did some shopping not long ago, I was able to find something that uh, the original price tag on, and it looked brand new, never worn, was $2,000. When I was able to pick that up for $50, I shelled out the 50 bucks and bought it. And it's, gonna, it's a surprise. <laughs> so I can't say much about it, too much about it, but I, sometimes you see a deal I was almost going to walk away from it, but there was a man there who said, hey, I got a friend who can do alterations, and I'll give you, here's his number. He says, you better buy this now. It's not going to be here. You know, when you come back, it's not going to be here. And uh, with his encouragement, I went ahead and bought it that day. Anyway, 
some you know some things the pearl of great price they the guy went and sold all he had to buy that as compared to God's kingdom that that's kind of what we should do we got some tremendous information from Mr. Armstrong tonight brother and if you didn't grab onto all of it you might want to take the video which you can find a little bit later in about an hour on cogtv.org go to our archive video page click on tonight's date which you'll see in about an hour from now you can probably also find this shortly after we sign off uh, on the Sabbath service page of Facebook Live. Listen to that section uh, where Mr. Armstrong just spoke and maybe play it two or three times. He, he covered a lot of good stuff for us tonight. A lot of good stuff we should be well aware on and, uh, and we're being trained to become kings and priests teachers in the world tomorrow we need to know God's truth and know it very thoroughly and where it is in God's Word I'm hopefully hopefully we were helpful somewhat in this Bible study with you for that tonight I'm gonna sign off wish you a good night's sleep happy Sabbath see those of you who are going to tune in with us in the morning 1030 Eastern time if you're going to tune in with us live 2:30 p.m. 2:30 in the afternoon British Standard Time, Greenwich Mean Time in London, England. Until then, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, thanks for joining me, and Shabbat Shalom, very, very happy Sabbath to you.